Chapter Three of Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy by William Henry Helm. Chapter Three Origins of Characters, Matchmaking, Second Marriages, Negative Qualities of the Novels close knowledge of one class dislike of lionizing madame de stal the lower orders tradesmen social position quality of jane's letters balls and parties in her letters as in her books the satiric touch was on almost everything that jane austen wrote her habit of making pithy little notes on the doings of her acquaintances was in writing to her sister irrepressible the pith was not bitter it was just the comment of a highly intelligent woman to whom the gods had given the gift of humour and who in an age when most girls of her day were as ingenuous as evelina or as catherine morland had learned how much insincerity and affectation coloured the conduct even of kind and well-meaning people in her references to the foibles of real men and women we gain many glimpses of the origins if not the originals of some of her character studies at an ashford ball in seventeen ninety eight one of the royal dukes was present and among those who supped in his company were cassandra and a mrs cage with whom the austens were well acquainted this lady was uneasy in the presence of royalty and her mistakes were described in a letter from cassandra james mention of the incident in her reply is a fair sample of the way in which in her more serious mood this young woman of twenty-three regarded the weakness of her less cool and reasonable friends i can perfectly comprehend mrs cage's distress and perplexity she has all those kinds of foolish and incomprehensible feelings which would make her fancy herself uncomfortable in such a party i love her however in spite of all her nonsense one can see a hint of mrs allen and mrs bennet in the silly woman who flustered herself and fidgeted her companions in her attempts to assume what she supposed to be the right behaviour on such an occasion jane who had never seen a prince so far as we know would have had no distress and perplexity she would have curtsied in the prettiest way the duke would have been charmed by her graceful figure her clear complexion and her soft brown eyes and she would next day have written to her sister all the minute particulars which only woman's language can make interesting her reflections on the gossip of the hour are not always quite so kindly when mr charles powlett of whose rejected offer of a kiss we have already heard brings home a wife jane tells her sister that this bride is discovered to be everything that the neighbourhood could wish her silly and cross as well as extravagant once when a story has reached her in the way that russian scandal is played by the muddling up of half understood particulars in the process of transmission from mouth to ear she has to correct a previous statement about some of the austin circle on inquiring of mrs clerk i find that mrs heathcote made a great blunder in her news of the crooks and morleys it is young mr crook who is to marry the second miss morley and it is the miss morleys instead of the second miss crook who were the beauties at the music meeting this seems a more likely tale a better devised imposture the sting is where stings usually are scandal was as distasteful to her as it can have been to madame de chatelet of whom voltaire said tout ce qui occupait la société était de son ressort or de merissance jane gave cassandra many little bits of news about their friends which the principals might have resented but between sister and sister such things are not scandalous and for those who read them now they may talk about the incidents referred to as freely as they like without harm to any one many of the scandals jane mentions are serious only in her innocent fun we hear for instance that in eighteen o nine martha and dr mant are as bad as ever he runs after her in the street to apologize for having spoken to a gentleman while she was near him the day before poor mrs mant can stand it no longer she has retired to one of her married daughters jane amused herself and her sister and teased poor martha by her jokes on this affair 
as dr m is a clergyman she writes this attachment however immoral has a decorous air mrs jennings sir john middleton's mother-in-law would have told the story quite seriously and with immense gusto at the barton breakfast-table but dr mant and martha were not transferred to a novel to the discomfort of themselves and their families and the delight of the romana clef hunters of southampton the letters do seem occasionally to bring us into the company of people whom we know quite well in the novels jane replying to cassandra at christmas seventeen ninety eight says i am glad to hear such a good account of harriet bridges she goes on now as young ladies of seventeen ought to do admired and admiring i dare say she fancies major elkington as agreeable as warren and if she can think so it is very well alter the surnames and this passage might apply as well to harriet smith as to harriet bridges i dare say she fancies mr martin as agreeable as mr churchill and if she can think so it is very well might have been written by emma to dear ann weston about the little friend from the boarding school jane as in this case of harriet bridges took so much interest in the love affairs of her friends that we often think of emma woodhouse and her matchmaking propensities about which mr knightley spoke so harshly by emma's advice harriet smith having refused robert martin the young farmer had regarded mr elton as a prospective husband and when he went elsewhere emma had selected frank churchill for the vacant post then through a serious mistake mr knightley was the man until at last the inconsiderate irrational unfeeling nature of her conduct became clear to her mind and harriet was allowed to marry the constant martin mrs mitford declared that jane austen was husband hunting at twelve years of age but the old lady's memory was evidently quite untrustworthy about people and dates when she talked such nonsense jane was however on her own showing fond of looking out for possible husbands for her pretty little nieces here is an instance from a letter of eighteen fourteen young wyndham accepts the invitation he is such a nice gentlemanlike unaffected sort of young man that i think he may do for fanny next day she is less pleased with him this young wyndham does not come after all a very long and very civil note of excuse has arrived it makes one moralize upon the ups and downs of this life that the habit was hereditary it was a custom of jane's time even more than it is of our own we may see from a report she sent to cassandra of the pleasure with which mr and mrs austen with one accord lighted upon a suitable match for their elder daughter he was a beauty of my mother's having no affair of her own to trouble her rest jane took an active part as adviser for those in whose fate she was affectionately interested especially was this the case with this favourite niece fanny knight who having fancied she was in love with one man discovered that she preferred or thought she preferred another do not be in a hurry wrote aunt jane the right man will come at last you will in the course of the next two or three years meet with somebody more generally unexceptionable than any one you have yet known who will love you as warmly as possible and who will so completely attract you you will feel you never really loved before fanny who was inimitable irresistible whose queer little heart and its flutterings were the delight of my life might have been fickle but she did not said her aunt deserve such a punishment as to fall in love after marriage and with the wrong man jane's views on second marriages are expressed in the case of lady sons whose haste to find consolation after the death of lord sons was the subject of much chatter among the mrs jenningses and the mrs bennets of her neighbourhood had her first marriage been of affection or had there been a grown-up single daughter i should not have forgiven her but i consider everybody as having a right to marry once in their lives for love if they can and provided she will now leave off having bad headaches and being pathetic i can allow her i can will her to be happy in the novels no woman of consequence excepting the callous and selfish lady susan vernon is allowed a second mate nor is the courtship before any of the marriages much in accord with the general practice of english fiction 
there is not even a description of some splendid wedding jane by the way did not regard a marriage as the proper occasion for public advertisement of the bride's qualities such a parade she writes of the conduct of a certain alarming bride is one of the most immodest pieces of modesty that one can imagine to attract notice could have been her only wish it might seem indeed that the most original characteristic of her works is the absence of almost all the qualities of plot and treatment on which fiction usually depends for success with the public if we are asked of some modern lady writer what are her books like and we replied in one respect they are conventional for they all end in the choosing of wedding rings but scarcely anybody in these novels feels the grand passion they have no relation to current events nobody ever has a strange adventure only one married woman is faithless to her vows no adventuress appears there are no foreigners no one is in revolt against anything nobody is seriously troubled about the trend of society or the decadence of morals and taste nobody starves or commits a murder or in engineers a swindle there are no cruel husbands no triple menages and no mysterious occurrences or detectives and as nobody dies nobody makes deathbed revelations the retort would probably imply what stupid stuff they must be these novels do indeed depend for their effect on less of plot and passion than almost any others of consequence yet written there are many novels of small plot balzac in eugenie grandet your sand in tamaris show that even stormy novelists can do with a modicum of events but the lack of both plot and passion is rare in the work that lives it is thus that the genius of jane austen is strongly displayed only genius could give a vital and enduring fascination to a record chiefly concerned with the ordinary experiences of a few respectable country people almost all of one class she had the power because with the gifts of expression and of humour she combined an almost perfect knowledge of a typical section of society all the more clearly exhibited because of her comparative ignorance of any other section she did not care to study the very poor the very rich were outside her circle of common experience and she would rarely write about people or phases of life that were not as familiar to her as the squire's daughter in the manners of the hunt ball she had none of disraeli's audacity my son said isaac disraeli when someone expressed surprise at the knowledge of exalted circles shown in the young duke my son sir when he wrote that book had never even seen a duke jane austen never having seen a duke or a ducal palace never attempted to describe either she shrank from any kind of lionizing whether in village society or in the great world and to this healthy pride is no doubt partly due the obscurity in which she lived and died one instance of her reserve may be adduced soon after the appearance of mansfield park she was invited in the politest manner to a party at the house of a nobleman who suspected her of the authorship of that book and who as an inducement intimated that she would be able to converse with madame de stal miss austen says her brother immediately declined the invitation to her truly delicate mind such a display would have given pain instead of pleasure the story which has sometimes been regarded as evidence of improper pride on the part of the english novelist is in keeping with all that is known of jane austen's nature had the meeting of the authors of emma and corinne come about one would like to have heard their conversation the talking would have largely been on one side madame who knew the world and enjoyed the distinction of having been called a wicked schemer and a fright by the greatest man of her time would have tried in vain to impress the unaffected englishwoman who cared so little for politics and napoleon that in whose novels which madame regarded as vulgaire she scarcely alluded to either jane would have listened attentively and now and again 
when madame paused for breath would have made a polite remark the covert humour of which would have been lost on her famous companion there is no suggestion that any hint as to madame de stal's reputation had reached chawton cottage otherwise some might suppose that it was not only the diffident modesty james brother alleges which prevented her from going to the party it is quite likely that she who described the loves of lydia bennett and maria rushworth with such an entire absence of sermonizing would yet have felt that though she might like to converse on a more private occasion with the author of corinne and delphine she would prefer not to be matched with a lady who had put to so practical a test her theories de l'influence des passions sur le bonheur could there be a stronger contrast physical or moral than between the country parson's slight and good-looking daughter whose knowledge of men and affairs was gained in the parlors of manor-houses and the assembly rooms of watering-places and the financier's stout and ugly daughter whose political activities were so persistent that she had been expelled from paris who had travelled mingling in the society of the governing classes the artists the men of letters in italy germany and other lands and whose literary performances historical political and imaginative were read wherever educated readers existed if jane had no strong desire to be brought into contact with the great wise and eminent of her time neither were her tastes at all in the direction of social equality or the advocacy of the rights of man and while she was indifferent to the famous and influential she was scarcely more concerned for the obscure and lowly admire her work as we may and love her as many of us must we cannot recognize that she was much in sympathy with any class but her own it is certainly to no undue regard for social position to no want of charitable intention that we can attribute her general neglect of the drama comedy and tragedy alike of humble life it might be said that she could and if she would have drawn the poor as well as she drew the gentry she knew her limitations and thus such rare sketches of the lower orders as she gives stop short of any errors of understanding mrs reynolds darcy's housekeeper whose admiration for her master and his sister is so strongly expressed and thomas the servant at barton cottage who comes in to describe how he has seen mr and mrs ferrars in exeter are in no way out of drawing though the phrase with which the author finishes off the man service thomas and the tablecloth now alike needless were soon dismissed so aptly suggests the position accorded to the working classes in her own works that it almost seems to have a double meaning let any one familiar with the novels try to recall occasions when a servant is introduced even in such common cases as the answering of a bell or waiting at table and he will find it hard to add to the examples already given any with a better part than the overworked nanny at the watsons who when lord osborne is paying his untimely visit puts her head in at the door and says please ma'am master wants to know why he bent to have his dinner as for the class from which most of these servants came it has no place at all emma takes harriet to a cottage where there is a convalescent child who requires jellies or beef tea but the visit is of no account except as leading up to the visit to mr elton and she goes to see an old servant while harriet pays her formal call at the abbey mill farm robert martin is a farmer and a letter from him is introduced but he has no share of any consequence in the dialogue when we remember jane austen's avowed partiality for emma and emma's disgust at the idea of harriet marrying a mere farmer no matter how much her admirer knightly might support the man's claims we may not unreasonably suppose that jane to some extent shared emma's prejudice there was however a notable exception to jane's remoteness from the farming class the joint tenant of the manor farm at steventon the happily married james digweed who seems to have been ordained later on was admitted to so much favour that she could not only dance and dine and gossip with him but could chaff her sister about his evident desire to gain cassandra's affection two or three apothecaries are admitted into the novels one attends jane bennett at netherfield and another attends marion dashwood at cleveland 
apothecary was almost a term of contempt in those days and one of jane's hits at the neighbourhood of hans place was that there seemed to be only one person there who was not an apothecary she even as we have seen corrects her niece for supposing that a country doctor not a mere apothecary would ever be introduced to appear the only country tradesman who figures at all prominently is sir william lucas who had risen to the honour of knighthood by an address to the king during his mayorality the distinction had perhaps been felt too strongly it had given him a disgust to his business by nature inoffensive friendly and obliging his presentation at st james had made him courteous he is not so diverting a creature as martin tinman of crickswich in mr meredith's delightful comedy the house on the beach who when rescued from that storm-beaten home on a terrible night was found to be wearing a court suit in which long before he had presented an address to the throne but sir william lucas's constant recollection of the fact that he had been received by the sovereign while his neighbours the small country gentlemen had not is illustrated with admirable art in his emporium with his stock in trade around him his portrait would never have been drawn mr weston also made money in trade apparently in the wholesale line after he had retired from the militia and of the proud and conceited bingley sisters we are told that they were of a respectable family in the north of england a circumstance more deeply impressed on their memories than that their brother's fortune and their own had been acquired by trade jane has many kindly things to tell her sister about her mother's maids especially of a faithful and industrious nanny of the maid's relations the agricultural class amid whose homes she passed nearly all her life she has as i have said left no account in her novels her letters do indeed contain many bits of news concerning the ploughmen and washerwomen of the parish and they are significant as to the manner proper to the age in which she regarded her humble neighbours her references to the cottagers are commonly devoid of any indication of deeper feeling than the consciousness of a need to give them clothes of the people employed on her father's farm she says john bond begins to find himself grow old which john bond ought not to do and unequal to much hard work a man is therefore hired to supply his place as to labour and john himself is to have the care of the sheep there are not more people engaged than before i believe only men instead of boys i fancy so at least but you know my stupidity as to such matters lizzie bond is just apprenticed to miss small so we may hope to see her able to spoil gowns in a few years about christmas seventeen ninety eight she writes of my charities to the poor since i came home you shall have a faithful account i have given a pair of worsted stockings to mary hutchins dame q mary stevens and dame staples a shift to hannah staples and a shawl to betty dawkins amounting in all to about half a guinea but i have no reason to suppose that the batties would accept of anything because i have not made them the offer of personal service we hear but little there is just the old lady bountiful idea adapted to the purse of the parson's younger daughter alms were what the poor chiefly wanted and alms they received if not in money in warm garments she gave them worsted stockings and flannel to wear in the cold weather she did not often so far as we hear sit and chat with dame staples and dame q over the things that made up their life interests or listen to the confidences of lizzie bond and hannah staples considering their rustic lovers sometimes we do hear of talks with poor women as when jane writes i called yesterday upon betty lond who inquired particularly after you and said she seemed to miss you very much because you used to call in upon her very often this was an oblique reproach at me which i am sorry to have merited and from which i will profit we may well believe that jane was no pioneer in district visiting her services to humanity were of another kind almost alone among the greater novelists who have written the fiction of drawing-rooms she was hardly less indifferent as a writer to the concerns of the governing class of her day than of the voteless class unless indeed she was a hostile witness so far as her knowledge went 
among the worst-bred persons in the novels with john thorpe mr collins and the ever delightful mrs bennet are sir walter elliot and lady catherine de bourg and the hero whose manners are most open to reproach is lady catherine's nephew darcy before he has been refused by elizabeth jane austen's views on the claims of social position as distinct from individual character were much the same as anne elliot's mr elliot and anne we learn did not always think alike his value for rank and connection she perceived to be greater than hers it was not merely complaisance it must be a liking to the cause which made him enter warmly into her father's and sister's solicitudes on a subject which she thought unworthy to excite them she was reduced to form a wish which she had never foreseen a wish that they had more pride had lady dalrymple and her daughter even been very agreeable she would still have been ashamed of the agitation they created but they were nothing there was no superiority of manner accomplishment or understanding the dalrymples and lady catherine de bourg do not lead one to suppose that jane's acquaintance with their class was a fortunate one had it been she would probably have given some happier examples of the titular aristocracy lord osborne in the watsons is in some ways a more amiable type but too sketchy to be of much account as an antidote to the unpleasing people as the aunt of darcy and the cousins of anne elliot if persons of artificial eminence are almost unknown in the novels there is an even more complete dearth of men or women distinguished for their individual gifts or achievements sir john middleton fills his too hospitable mansion with an endless supply of guests who keep his maidservants hard at work in preparing spare bedrooms that were occupied the night before for fresh arrivals in the afternoon he hardly allows time to speed the parting guests before he must return to welcome their successors but no statesman or traveller or professor not so much as a rising politician or a poet crosses those ever open doors they do not come for one reason and it seems a sufficient one because they scarcely exist for the author or if they do the people who eat mutton and drink port and madeira around the mahogany tables at netherfield or barton or upper cross know and care nothing whatever about them and their performances each thinks his little set mankind is as true of the characters in jane austen's books as in a sense it is true one is sometimes inclined to think of their author the moorlands the musgroves and woodhouses and bennets have never travelled unless an occasional visit to london may count as travel they have been into some neighbouring county they have been perchance to bath they have not so much as been to paris emma had never seen the sea twenty years earlier it would have been different darcy at any rate would have known something of france had he been twenty years older from the outbreak of the revolution till the first exile of napoleon france was not a likely place for any but the most adventurous of squires to choose for a pleasure trip nor after the rise of napoleon's star were the accessible parts of the continent very attractive for any but soldiers of fortune and spies thus not only are the conversations which jane austen offers devoid of any such elements of interest as are introduced for example by the appearance of byron in venetia or of shelley in nightmare abbey but the opportunities of lively talk offered by reminiscences of foreign manners and scenes are not allowed to the author on the other hand we do not meet with any of those egotistical travellers who as a contemporary of jane austen's declared if you introduce the name of a river or hill instantly deluge you with the rhine or make you dizzy with the height of mont blanc in any case however much the fact may be due to want of opportunities for enlarging her knowledge jane literature apart took very little interest in anything outside the social and family life of her own class in the country her published correspondence has been described as trivial as her novels have been for that is what madame de stal meant by vulgaire and not vulgar as sir james mackintosh and others have supposed and in comparison with such contemporary letters as byron's or lamb's 
her accounts of her dances and her bonnets are certainly weak tea for serious readers they are however exactly such letters as she might have been expected to write her satire gives them an agreeable tartness which somehow suggests the syllabubs which were so common a feature of the supper tables of her times it is all one may reasonably suppose like the common talk of the drawing-room in a manor-house on an afternoon when the men are hunting or shooting the choice of a winter frock the prospects of a ball at some territorial magnates the errors of cooks and housemaids the fatuity of this young man who is so rich and the silliness of that young woman who is so pretty enlivened by jane's wit the dances whether full-dress balls or merely small and early hops were among the favourite pleasures of jane austen if you have read her letters you will feel that she is present when fanny price dances so prettily at mansfield park or when darcy declines to dance with elizabeth because though she is tolerable she is not handsome enough to tempt him i danced twice with warren last night and once with mr charles watkins and to my inexpressible astonishment i entirely escaped john lyford i was forced to fight hard for it however we had a very good supper and the greenhouse was illuminated in a very elegant manner such bits of news are common at all periods of jane's correspondence for example the ball on thursday was a very small one indeed hardly so large as an oxford smack and again our ball on thursday was a very poor one only eight couple and but twenty-three people in the room just as it was when they got up the scratch dance at the bertrams the thought only of the afternoon built on the late acquisition of a violin player in the servants hall on another occasion at a public hall at the county town the portsmouths dorchesters boltons portals and clerks were there and all the meaner and more usual etc etc there was a scarcity of men in general and a still greater scarcity of any that were good for much i danced nine dances out of ten five with stephen terry t shute and james digweed and four with catherine there was commonly a couple of ladies standing up together but not often any so amiable as ourselves jane from all we know of her would almost as soon dance with another girl as with a man it was the dancing she loved and watching the behaviour of others their flirtations their love-making their airs and affectations emma woodhouse the day after a dance at highbury might have sent to her sister in brunswick square just such an account as jane austen to her sister at godmersham there were very few beauties and such as there were were not very handsome one of the girls seemed to her a queer animal with a white neck mrs warren i was constrained to think a very fine young woman which i much regret she danced away with great activity her husband is ugly enough uglier even than his cousin john but he does not look so very old the miss maitlands are both prettyish very like anne with brown skins large dark eyes and a good deal of nose the general has got the gout and mrs maitland the jaundice the ball to which jane austen went in eighteen o eight her thirty-fourth year was rather more amusing than she expected the melancholy part was to see so many dozen young women standing by without partners and each of them with two ugly naked shoulders it was the same room in which we danced fifteen years ago i thought it all over and in spite of the shame of being so much older felt with thankfulness that i was quite happy now as then we paid an additional shilling for our tea this letter is but one of many bits of evidence that no memory of a captain wentworth troubled jane's own life the shame such a woman could have felt in being older one can scarcely imagine and the context shows it was not seriously felt the most pathetic dancing incident in the novels was the impromptu affair at uppercross in persuasion where anne saw her old lover apparently losing his heart elsewhere the evening ended with dancing on its being proposed anne offered her services as usual and though her eyes would sometimes fill with tears as she sat at the instrument she was extremely glad to be employed and desired nothing in return but to be unobserved 
she did not know that wentworth who was making so merry with the musgrove girls was faithful all the time to his old love herself we might doubt whether the author knew it until later on in the story were it not that the idea of ending a novel without the marriage of the principal maiden to the man she liked best would have been entirely foreign to jane austen's method so frederick wentworth danced with the musgroves and anne played for their delight the dance most fully described was that given by the westons at the crown when mr elton behaved so abominably to harriet smith and mr knightley showed himself a preux chevalier and saved emma's lovely protege from the humiliation of being the only wallflower in describing how elizabeth at netherfield catherine at bath harriet at highbury and fanny at mansfield park idly watched the dancing because no man had asked them to join it jane pretty girl and excellent dancer as she was spoke from personal experience once at any rate when in the pride of youth and beauty she was able to write after a dance at a neighbouring house i do not think i was very much in request people were rather apt not to ask me till they could not help it one's consequence you know varies so much at times without any particular reason there was one gentleman an officer of the cheshire a very good-looking young man who i was told wanted very much to be introduced to me but as he did not want it quite enough to make much trouble in effecting it we never could bring it about she would not if she could help it dance with bad partners one of my gayest actions she writes after a ball was sitting down two dances in preference to having lord bolton's eldest son for my partner who danced too ill to be endured it is in connection with one of the weston's parties that mr woodhouse makes his sage observations on the eternal question of ventilation when frank churchill says that the fresh air difficulty will be settled by their dancing in a large room so that the windows need not be opened because it is that dreadful habit of opening the windows letting in cold air upon heated bodies which does the mischief mr woodhouse cries open the windows but surely mr churchill nobody would think of opening the windows at randall's nobody could be so imprudent i never heard of such a thing dancing with open windows i am sure neither your father nor mrs weston poor miss taylor that was would suffer it ah sir but a thoughtless young person will sometimes step behind a window curtain and throw up a sash without its being suspected i have often known it done myself have you indeed sir bless me i never could have supposed it but i live out of the world and am often astonished at what i hear the conversation of this valetudinarian quietist is always diverting he suggests that emma should leave the coles party before it is half over as it is so bad to be up late but my dear sir cries mr weston if emma comes away early it will be breaking up the party and no great harm it does says mr woodhouse the sooner every party breaks up the better advancing maturity did not do much to spoil jane's love of dances from southampton in eighteen o nine she wrote your silence on the subject of our ball makes me suppose your curiosity too great for words we were very well entertained and could have stayed longer but for the arrival of my list shoes to convey me home and i did not like to keep them waiting in the cold if jane tells cassandra about her own dances she is ever ready in return for news of cassandra's i shall be extremely anxious to hear the event of your ball and shall hope to receive so long and minute an account of every particular that i shall be tired of reading it we were at a ball on saturday i assure you we dined at goodnestone and in the evening danced two country dances in the boulangeries this french dance by the way was on the unwritten programme at mr bingley's ball in pride and prejudice it seems to have had its birth in the revolution when the bakers men and women together kept themselves warm by joining hands and dancing up and down the streets after jane fairfax had sung herself hoarse at the coles party the proposal of dancing originating nobody knew exactly where was so effectually promoted by mr and mrs cole that everything was rapidly clearing away to give proper space mrs weston 
capital in her country dances was seated and beginning an irresistible waltz and frank churchill coming up with the most becoming gallantry to emma had secured her hand and led her up to the top where she led off the dance with genuine spirit and enjoyment the waltz was a novelty still in those days and seems here to be classed as a country dance it had been imported from germany where mozart had done much to forward its triumph after jane austen had written her earlier novels and i cannot remember any other reference to it in her work it was at first considered an improper dance and one need not be surprised that a generation which had danced nothing more intimate than the boulangeries were at first a little flustered by the new fashion sheridan watching the dancers in a ballroom repeated the following lines of his own composition which aptly suggest the contrast between the old dancing and the new as it struck the eyes of our great grand aunts about the time when emma danced at the crown and jane austen at goodnestone with tranquil step and timid downcast glance behold the well-paired couple now advance in such sweet posture our first parents moved while hand in hand through eden's bowers they roved ere yet the devil with promise fine and false turned their poor heads and taught them how to waltz little wonder when a waltz was regarded as forbidden fruit if edmund bertram fanny and sir thomas were shocked at the very idea of play-acting by the family and guests at mansfield park not that there were wanting plenty of quiet souls who were in no wise personally distressed at the impropriety of the waltz on their own account just as in the other matter of amateur theatricals and the choice of a play when lady bertrand asked her children not to act anything improper it was not because she had any personal objection to offer but because sir thomas would not like it the bertram's ill-fated theatricals and the waltz which mrs weston played served to emphasize the place which jane austen fills as a historian of the transition from the formal prudery of the sceptical eighteenth century to the broader liberties of the scientific nineteenth what has become of all the shyness in the world she asks her sister in eighteen o seven shyness and the sweating sickness have given way to confidence in paralytic complaints morals change but little as compared to moors the girls who act in private theatricals every winter and dance twenty waltzes a night half the year round are no whit less virtuous than their great-grandmothers who were shocked at the waltz and caught cold in clothes which were so thin that as a close observer has recorded you could see the gleam of their garter buckles through the silks and kersimeres as they danced and altogether so suitable for a classical revival that a contemporary poet was moved to utter the quatrain when dressed for the evening the girls nowadays scarce an atom of dress on them leave nor blame them for what is an evening dress but a dress that is suited to eve thus the mother of mankind is accused by one poet of having danced the first waltz and held responsible by another for the airy fashions of the recamier period one of the principal differences of etiquette we may note before passing on between the customs of the ballroom a century ago and now was that in the days when john lyford was eluded with so much difficulty a girl danced two successive dances with the same partner as a matter of course so that neither an imaginary john thorpe nor a real john lyford could be got rid of by the promise of one dance the scraps from the letters given on the last few pages help us to realize how clearly jane austen's own life is at times reflected in her books End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jane Austen and Her Country House Comedy by William Henry Helm Chapter 4 Ethics and Optimism dr waitley on jane austen moral lessons of her novels charge of indelicacy marriage as a profession a problem novel the nostalgia of the infinite 
the whitewashing of willoughby lady susan condemned by its author the watsons change in manners no heroes woman's love the prince regent the quarterly review the moral lessons of this lady's novels wrote archbishop waitley in his quarterly article of eighteen twenty one though clearly and impressively conveyed are not offensively put forward but spring incidentally from the circumstances of the story so inoffensively indeed are they offered to our notice that dr waitley himself seems to have been unable to discover them at all on the whole writes the archbishop miss austen's works may safely be recommended not only as among the most unexceptionable of their class but as combining in an eminent degree instruction with amusement though without the direct effort at the former of which we have complained as sometimes defeating its object the most obvious moral of jane austen's novels is that if you are a heroine you need not trouble yourself about your future you are certain to marry a worthy man with an income sufficient for a comfortable existence he may be endowed with something less than a thousand a year like edward ferrars with a couple of thousand like captain wentworth or with the ten thousand a year which made darcy appear so admirable to mrs bennet in any case you will not have to eat bread and scrape or go without a fire in your bedroom the country-house comedy of jane austen is full of morals if you are in need of them but it was not written to improve you only to amuse you and its maker if you must have a clear moral for each story after the manner of tracts you may take them thus pride and prejudice conveys the useful lesson that the person you most dislike in one month may be the one you will very sensibly give your affection to in the next sense and sensibility that when the bad man falls into the pit he has dug for himself the good man comes by his own emma that the man whose society is most necessary to a woman's quiet contentment is the man she ought to marry mansfield park that a simple unaffected girl who gains the second place in a man's affections may win the prize through the disqualification of her more brilliant rival persuasion that nothing is more likely to revive an old passion than to see its object warmly admired by some other eligible party northanger abbey that a tuft hunting father may be induced to receive a daughter-in-law of no importance by the kindly influence of a son-in-law of superior rank as for lady susan the moral of that unpleasing story is that if a worldly mater pulchra is the rival in love of an ingenuous filia pulchriar she will probably lose the battle after much suffering on either side and from the watsons we may see that if a girl is educated above her family she will find it hard to be happy beside the domestic hearth all these are plain workable morals whether the author of the novels would have endorsed them we cannot certainly know but it is more than probable she would not we need not suppose that jane austen was ignorant of the coarseness of conversation the hard drinking the wild gambling the moral laxity of a large section of society that are so frequently exhibited in the records of the age in spite of the improvement in manners but we can hardly help laughing at the objection taken to her novels even by some of her contemporaries that they were indelicate the indelicacy was usually found in the views of marriage held and expressed by the heroines and their families the love affairs of these country maidens were not often we must admit such as to steal away their beauty sleep or spoil their appetites for breakfast mrs jennings kindly endeavoured to cure a girl's disappointment in love by a variety of sweetmeats and olives and a good fire was perhaps not wholly unjustified by experience in those days when no profession save that of governess was open to women when nursing the sick was regarded as an occupation specially suitable for those of a low class when no door opened from the drawing-room on to the professional stage and when the very idea of a female as secretary to a man of affairs or of business would have been condemned as improper marriage was undoubtedly viewed by most people as the only aim of a young woman the pleasantest preservative from want as charlotte lucas regarded it 
and moreover the average age of brides was much lower than it is nowadays to avoid being a governess by attracting the admiration of a man who could afford a wife was the hope at least of most poorly endowed girls and even if matrimony is not viewed with so much sentiment and reserve by jane austen's heroines as by the excessively squeamish evelina we may be inclined to prefer the indelicacy of jane austen to the elaborate delicacy of fanny burney scott himself by an ingenious paradox has been accused as a novelist of immorality and quentin durward in particular has been described as one of the most immoral novels that has ever been written because its romance expresses nothing the interest a boy takes in its romantic passages depends on the fact that he dreams himself to be in similar circumstances he must treat the novel subjectively and it is the subjective use of the imagination which does all the damage it is in reading such books as this that a bad habit of mind is begun and quentin durward is more immoral for a boy of fourteen than a translation of the most shockingly indecent french novel well may the anonymous writer of this unexpected criticism add there are paradoxes to be met everywhere and most of all in the question of morality this particular kind of immorality has not yet so far as i know been charged against jane austen she cannot be justly accused of writing romance which expresses nothing but she certainly leaves plenty of opportunity for young readers to exercise their imaginations and thus begin a bad habit of mind the view of marriage as a profession with or without ardent affection is not the only thing that has shocked the delicacy of many of jane austen's readers serious objection has been taken to her introduction of episodes of an improper nature how is the charge supported lydia bennett a vulgar badly brought up girl still in her teens infatuated with the red coats of the militia officers insists on going away with wickham and lives with him as his mistress until by the generous aid of darcy and the determination of the gardeners her uncle and aunt a marriage is arranged and does shortly take place this episode say the stern critics was one unnecessary to the plot and two if it was necessary it is too much insisted on and developed that it is an essential part of the little plot worked in to exhibit the best side of darcy's character which before has only been seen in its least attractive light seems to me obvious and i agree with professor saintsbury's opinion that it brings about the denouement with complete propriety lydia's entire indifference to the moral aspect of her conduct is and was unusual in a girl of sixteen and of her class but her character from first to last is consistently drawn and the contrast between the selfishness of wickham and lydia who care nothing for anyone's happiness except their own and not even for each other's and the sympathy of heart and variety of temperament which bring elizabeth and darcy together is admirably drawn then we are asked to be shocked at the illustration of the bad character and selfish cruelty of willoughby given to eleanor dashwood by the very worthy and very dull colonel brandon in sense and sensibility it is a painful story willoughby the faithless lover of marianne dashwood had seduced an impressionable girl whom brandon out of affection for the memory of her mother herself ruined by a scoundrel had practically adopted and whom such scandal-mongers as mrs jennings declared to be the colonel's own child why drag in this nasty story asked the objectors and above all why allow the colonel to pour it into the ears of a young girl like eleanor that it comes unfortunately from brandon who is a rival hopeless as it had seemed of willoughby for marianne's affection and that in the middle-class society of to-day a well-bred man would not tell such a tale to a girl if he could find any other means of achieving an imperative object is undeniable what was brandon to do he knew that marianne was pining for love of a man at least as unworthy of her as in his worst days was tom jones of sophia and he believed with or without reason 
that the knowledge of willoughby's character would be a bitter but efficacious medicine for her heart sickness eleanor the sensible prudent devoted sister seemed the only person to whom he could tell the story with any hope that it would be discreetly used he had spent many hours in convincing himself that he was right and when eleanor said i understand you you have something to tell me of mr willoughby that will open his character farther your telling it will be the greatest act of friendship that can be shown to marianne my gratitude will be ensured immediately by any information tending to that end and hers must be gained by it in time pray pray let me hear it there is little reason for wonder that upon this hint he spake and told the story of the moral ruin of the mother and the cruel desertion of the daughter which the reader of sense and sensibility will recall eleanor lost little time in retailing it to her sister with the immediate and apparently unexpected effect of increasing the girl's unhappiness she felt the loss of willoughby's character yet more heavily than she had felt the loss of his heart though we know that she soon afterwards became as fond a wife of colonel brandon as she ever could have been of willoughby far more remarkable i think than brandon's telling eleanor the miserable story of his sister-in-law and her daughter is the manner in which eleanor herself receives willoughby's attempt to excuse his conduct he admits his treatment of miss williams but asks how eleanor could think colonel brandon an impartial reporter of the affair and proceeds to offer his own excuse in the words that follow i do not mean to justify myself but at the same time cannot leave you to suppose that i have nothing to urge that because she was injured she was irreproachable and because i was a libertine she must be a saint if the violence of her passion the weakness of her understanding i do not mean however to defend myself her affection for me deserved better treatment and i often with great self-reproach recall the tenderness which for a very short time had the power of creating any return i wish i heartily wish it had never been but i have injured more than herself and i have injured one whose affection for me may i say it was scarcely less warm than hers and whose mind oh how infinitely superior in other words the inexperienced child was of weak understanding and loved him passionately and therefore he was not so much to blame as if she had been less warm in her affection and stronger in her intelligence surely the reasoning should have been reversed yet after this fine oration eleanor pities him and when he goes on to disparage his wife whom he has married for her fortune and to express his continued love for marianne all that eleanor says is you are very wrong mr willoughby very blamable you ought not to speak in this way either of mrs willoughby or my sister and in saying this her voice in spite of itself betrayed her compassionate emotion when he left her eleanor assured him that she thought better of him than she had done that she forgave pitied him wished him well was even interested in his happiness and added some gentle counsel as to the behaviour most likely to promote it counsel which he showed little disposition to take this tolerance by eleanor for a man who on his own admission had taken advantage of a simple young girl ignorant in the world's ways this readiness to allow extenuating circumstances to a mercenary breaker of reputations and hearts is a far more serious fact than the mere introduction of a story which does fit quite easily into the plan of the novel eleanor's reflections when willoughby had ended his apologies sufficiently show that the point of view suggested in the duologue between the sinner and the sister was deliberately set up by the author she made no answer her thoughts were silently fixed on the irreparable injury which too early in independence and its consequent habits of idleness dissipation and luxury had made in the mind the character the happiness of a man who to every advantage of person and talents united a disposition naturally open and honest and a feeling affectionate temper the world had made him extravagant and vain extravagance and vanity had made him cold-hearted and selfish vanity 
while seeking its own guilty triumph at the expense of another had involved him in a real attachment which extravagance or at least its offspring necessity had required to be sacrificed each faulty propensity in leading him to evil had led him likewise to punishment the attachment from which against honour against feeling against every better interest he had outwardly torn himself now when no longer allowable governed every thought and the connection for the sake of which he had with little scruple left her sister to misery was likely to prove a source of unhappiness to himself of a far more incurable nature the chapter describing this interview between willoughby and eleanor is the only one in all the novels of jane austen wherein a problem after the kind dear to the dramatist of to-day and the novelists of yesterday is fully presented and considered the heroines with this exception answering to mr andrew lang's description being ignorant of evil as it seems and unacquainted with vain yearnings and interesting doubts eleanor only as we find her on this occasion is a pioneer of that school of sociology which whitewashes the individual at the expense of his early environment and education her defence of this wretched man is in principle that which an old bailey advocate offers when he cites the theories of lombroso in favour of a beetle-browed criminal who has stuck his knife into the breast of some confiding woman it was the world that made him what he was he was to be pitied not condemned though we have not to consider here whether eleanor and the advocate are right or wrong it is hard to avoid the thought that when she wrote this remarkable chapter jane austen was influenced in a degree quite unusual in that age with people of her class by the sense of futility which not long before her day had been the motive of candide voltaire's irony is bitter in spite of the optimism which his book preaches and of the essential kindness of his nature while jane austen's is as sweet as irony can ever be that she was intentionally ironical in this case of eleanor's tolerance is scarcely possible only a cynic would treat a pure-minded maiden's apology for a heartless seducer as a subject for covert satire and jane was not a cynic writing of maria edgeworth in his notes for a diary sir m e grant duff says in her as in miss austen there is something wanting is it what has been called the nostalgie d'infini that intellectual ailment is more common nowadays than it was in the eighteenth century and there was little of it in the grey matter of any country brains when jane was born certainly it cannot be diagnosed from her work generally only in the particular case of eleanor and willoughby does that idea of the helplessness of man in the maelstrom of infinity which has paralyzed the wills of so many unhappy victims and induced the devastating literature of determinism seem to have entered into her plan of work for only thus can i account for the moral whitewashing of willoughby not by a man of the world with his after all and his human nature arguments but by a country ingenue the more i read jane austen's writings the stronger grows my conviction that she was one of those fortunate beings whose optimism is differentiated from pessimism by the good offices of an excellent digestion and an even pulse we need not suppose that she thought much about the philosophical sanction of conduct as opposed to the purely religious or that she had studied the french encyclopedia she was born and brought up in an atmosphere wherein convention in regard to the things that matter was almost omnipotent and she was not of the type whereof iconoclasts are made she attacked no system social or religious but she had no fondness for isms and thus it is that dogmatism is quite as hard to discover in her writings as scepticism it has already been said that jane austen was not a cynic yet it would be easy by making lady susan one's text and ignoring the rest of her writings to show that she was as cynical as a swift or an anatole france of course 
i do not mean that her apparent cynicism in this case was exercised on the kind of subjects which is ridiculed in the tale of a tub or in l'ile du pinguin but i know nothing in its way more cold-blooded in the presentation of love than the conclusion of that novel of jane springtime which she herself her own wise critic withheld from publication the rivalry of mother and daughter for the affections of the same man must always be an unpleasant subject and the story of the conflict between lady susan vernon and her daughter for the matrimonial prize represented by reginald de courcy as told in letters among the characters concerned is on a low plane the morals of the heroine may not be suspect but her tone is below suspicion what is the denouement of lady susan the mother's schemes to marry the man of her daughter's choice have ended in her own marriage to the wealthy noodle whom she had tried to force upon the daughter frederica says the author dropping the correspondence plan in order to wind up the book more readily was therefore fixed in the family of her uncle and aunt till such time as reginald de courcy could be talked flattered and finessed into an affection for her which allowing leisure for the conquest of his attachment to her mother for his abjuring all future attachments and detesting the sex might reasonably be looked for in the course of a twelvemonth three months might have done it in general but reginald's feelings were no less lasting than lively whether lady susan was or was not happy in her second choice i do not see how it can be ever ascertained it is certain that to some considerable extent lady susan was a satire on several lady novelists of the period all jane austen's novels are more or less satirical from northanger abbey which is full of burlesque passages to persuasion in which they are so rare that it needs a hunt to discover any whether or not lady susan was intended to be taken more seriously than in jest it is a dull performance the whole plan and treatment of the book are artificial it was not jane's natural instinct or her finer art which was at work in its making so foreign is it to herself that if the manuscript had been found in some cupboard of a manor-house no occupants of which had been of known relationship to the austins i doubt if it would have been attributed to her by any one who had not made a meticulous comparison of its phraseology with her acknowledged works there is i think no surer evidence of jane's fine taste alike in character and in literature than that having brought this novel to completion she deliberately suppressed it had she sold it to a publisher and allowed it to run its chance of popularity like the rest of her finished novels we should have had to revise our views on her nature and judgment to a considerable extent as it is the fact that having written a poor novel of disagreeable tendency she recognized the unsatisfactory thing that she had done in time to cancel it it is much in her favor and justifies the opinion that whatever defects of subject or of treatment we may find in lady susan were condemned by its author it is for this reason that we need not regret the decision of her nephew and niece to publish many years after their aunt's death the book which she herself had withheld only let us never forget as we read it that it was cancelled by the author the watsons was produced as far as can be ascertained in that middle period of jane's life when after her father's resignation of the steventon living he was spending his few remaining years at bath with his wife and daughters having written three of her six novels in the nineties of the eighteenth century the six novels by which she chose to be judged at stevenson she produced nothing more of her best until at chawton in the early years of the nineteenth century she completed her life's work all her books that live by their own merits were written in the heart of the country the book that comes nearest to the commonest fiction of her period was chiefly written in a town which however staid and irreproachable in its tone at the present date was in her time a centre of worldliness and frivolity the rivals was first acted in the year of jane austen's birth but the picture it offers of bath society is almost as true of eighteen o two as of seventeen seventy five dress had changed much in the intervening years 
but in all else there seems to have been little change between the bath of sheraton the lover of elizabeth linley and the bath of sheridan the friend of the prince regent it was among lydia languishes and captain absolutes that jane austen walked in milsom street and danced at the assembly rooms in eighteen o two to five and it was in an atmosphere of social affectation and busy idleness that she found her powers unequal to any nobler performance than the account of the husband hunting and silly young women who angle for lord osborne and his friends the futilities of the watsons form a remarkable interlude between pride and prejudice and mansfield park the rural society into which jane austen takes us in all her novels marks a rapid development from the manners of the preceding age if we regard the squire western of fielding as representative of a considerable class of the country gentlemen of his time we may wonder how it is that no such rude disturber of the peace bursts in among the woodhouses and the dashwoods his nearest relation in jane's novels is sir john middleton and he with all his noise and ignorance is a quiet well-bred person in comparison with the rude father of the delicious sophia even the less rubicund and animal squire of the hardcastle species is here unknown and squire allworthy himself would have been strange in the drawing-rooms of mansfield park and pemberley or the parlours of longbourn and hartfield there is less change to be seen in the manners and tones of the women especially the younger women than of the men sophia and amelia would have used a few expressions perhaps that might have made emma stare and cry good god or the fine colour deepen on elizabeth's cheeks and marianne dashwood would have confided to eleanor her astonishment that such otherwise attractive girls should be so ignorant of the poets and of the proper arrangement of natural scenery had the girls become confidential on further acquaintance sophia might have wondered why elizabeth said so little about the appearance of her lover and so much about his intelligence but tom jones and booth would never have gotten on intimate terms with knightley or darcy or edward ferrars until these austin young men had drunk more port than anybody in james novels with the exception of john thorpe as described by himself could carry without disaster there are no heroes among these honest gentlemen of a hundred years ago wentworth has indeed won credit and fortune at sea bertram and knightley do nothing to entitle them to the name beyond marrying the heroine edward ferrars merely behaves properly in keeping faith with lucy as long as she wants him darcy is heroic in taking mrs bennet for a mother-in-law henry tilney makes fun of his chosen mate in a way that would have cost him her heart in a more conventional novel il y a des héros à mal comme en bien says rochefoucauld but of the evil-doing kind there are none here unless indeed the effrontery which with which after jilting marianne for a rich wife willoughby comes to her sister eleanor and asks for her sympathy for his sad fate or the coolness of wickham in the presence of the people he has wronged may be regarded as evidence of heroism it is to the wonderfully true presentation of the hearts and minds of girls that these novels chiefly owe their immense power of attraction even for readers who miss the greater part of the humour fanny price and eleanor dashwood are themselves but poorly endowed with humour and catherine morland only possesses it in the rudimentary way of a lively schoolgirl with how much of understanding how clearly and fully are the hopes and fears the innocent little plans of fanny and catherine the more matured and reasoned ways of eleanor shown to us without the least apparent effort the trustful reader nurtured on the successful fiction of our own time especially that of the last ten years during which english novelists have been able to indulge themselves and their public by the introduction of incidents and types of character which up to about the commencement of that decade would have secured the ban of the circulating libraries has been led to believe that sensual impulse plays as large a part in a woman's life as in a man's that such women as lady belliston and tom jones arabelle in le lit dans le valet or the bologna of richard feverel exist and in great numbers 
is certain but they are not representative of woman balzac who was not much restrained by any fear of the libraries knew that many faceless wives so very common in french fiction and drama whatever they might be in life gave themselves to men their love for whom contained much less of sensuality than of other instincts esther the unhappy jewess of splendeur et misé de courtesan loves lucienne with an affection far more chaste than that which many a correct heroine is made to display for the man with whom she goes to the altar in the last chapter the mistresses of famous men as known to us from memoirs and histories have not generally been of a sensual nature aspasia most distinguished of them all was of the intellectual not the sensual type strangely indelicate as was madame du chatelet her relations with voltaire were based on affinity of literary taste and critical appreciation much more than on physical attraction even among the unintellectual women who have figured among the grand amoureuses of history the passion of the woman does not in most instances appear to have been of the coarser kind louise de la valliere is at least more typical of womanhood than barbara villiers emma woodhouse deeply distressed at the supposed intention of knightley to marry harriet smith feels that she cares not what may happen if he will but remain single all his life could she be secure of that indeed of his never marrying at all she believes she should be perfectly satisfied let him but continue the same mr knightley to her and her father the same mr knightley to all the world let donwell and hartfield lose none of their precious intercourse of friendship and confidence and her peace would be fully secured marriage in fact would not do for her marriage we know did for her very well and not at all so far as we have her story in the idiomatic sense in which words are commonly used but in this healthy maiden who could regard with equanimity a future wherein the man she liked best should never be more to her than a dear friend who dropped in for tea or supper we have an effective illustration of the relative insignificance of passion in jane austen's view of life emma woodhouse has near relations in eleanor dashwood and edward ferrars who after the marriage of lucy steele to robert ferrars had cleared away the only barrier to their own avowals of affection were neither of them quite enough in love to think that three hundred and fifty pounds a year would supply them with the comforts of life kitty and lydia bennett could simultaneously adore all the officers of a militia regiment but there was nothing of the all for love and all the world well lost nonsense about any of the agreeable women of jane austen's creation they were not to be captured by a man's attractions of mind and person in the way that millamont was by mirabel's nor even by the art of others as beatrice was one for benedick and he for her the names of millamont and beatrice were in the ancestral tree of elizabeth bennet but her pulses beat more regularly than theirs in the effect of mary crawford's charms on edmund bertram we may see some pale suggestion of such an awakening as that of robert orange in the school for saints who on meeting with bridget suddenly had found presented to him a mind and a nature in such complete harmony with his own that it seemed as though he were the words and she the music of one song but it was only a seeming in edmund's case and while we read jane austen our thoughts are rarely allowed to flow into a romeo and juliet channel for more than a few moments at a time the reawakening of wentworth's dormant love for anne elliot would have afforded to most lady novelists an opportunity for some fine romantic writing jane austen allows herself no romance in the matter the sea air at lyme has heightened anne's colour and a passing visitor her cousin as it happens is attracted by her appearance wentworth notices his glances of admiration and is reminded that she is charming when they came to the steps leading upwards from the beach a gentleman at the same moment preparing to come down politely drew back and stopped to give them way they ascended and passed him and as they passed anne's face caught his eye 
and he looked at her with a degree of earnest admiration which she could not be insensible of she was looking remarkably well her very regular very pretty features having the bloom and freshness of youth restored by the fine wind which had been blowing on her complexion and by the animation of eye which it had also produced it was evident that the gentleman completely a gentleman in manner admired her exceedingly captain wentworth looked round at her instantly in a way which showed his noticing of it he gave her a momentary glance a glance of brightness which seemed to say that man is struck with you and even i at this moment see something like anne elliot again this scene may be deficient in the sentiment that delights catherine morland's and marianne dashwood's but it is a bit of true observation of a familiar phrase of human folly archbishop waitley remarks that authoresses can scarcely ever forget that they are authoresses they seem to feel a sympathetic shudder at exposing naked a female mind elle se peignant en boost and leave the mysteries of womanhood to be described by some interloping male like richardson or merivaux who is turned out before he has seen half the rights and is forced to spin from his own conjectures the rest now from this fault miss austen is free her heroines are what one knows women must be though one can never get them to acknowledge it it is a striking proof of the little that was known of jane austen by her contemporaries that even four years after her death neither waitley himself nor the editor of the quarterly review knew how to spell her name the criticism that the mind brought up on modern fiction would be likely to make on the girls of jane austen would be the reverse of waitley's it would be that her chief defect in depicting woman's character was that she almost invariably did force the reader to spin from his own conjectures when the mysteries of the heart were the subjects of her pages the truth is divided i think between the archbishop and the supposed modern critic jane austen's heroines are true women admirably portrayed but they only represent a certain proportion of their sex it would never be suspected of elizabeth or eleanor or anne or fanny that there was southern blood in her veins there might have been a few drops no more in marianne's the feelings of the author are reflected in her most attractive characters she might have married again and again of that there can be small doubt and while for herself she shared dorothy osborne's opinion as to the essentials of conjugal happiness i fancy that she would have also agreed with dorothy's brother that all passions have more of trouble than satisfaction in them and therefore they are happiest that have least of them that indeed as we have already seen was very much the fault that miss bronte found in her as a novelist anne elliot comes nearer than any of her fellow heroines to dorothy osborne's ideal of the changelessness of affection the true union of hearts but save for her involuntary tears at musgrove's she kept her feelings under the most perfect control and never we may be sure tried to beat her convictions into the heads of her silly family or even of her faithful friend lady russell there were we may fairly believe not a few who would like to have been jane's chosen mate one such unhappy being seems as we read to be the actor in the little bit of serious comedy related with lively exaggeration in a letter written when she was twenty-five years old your unfortunate sister was betrayed last thursday into a situation of the utmost cruelty i arrived at ash park before the party from dean and was shut up in the drawing-room with mr holder alone for ten minutes i had some thoughts of insisting on the housekeeper or mary corbett being sent for and nothing could prevail on me to move two steps from the door on the lock of which i kept one hand constantly fixed elizabeth bennet was not more uncomfortable when her mother took kitty upstairs after breakfast in order that mr collins might have what he called the honour of a private audience with the elder girl dear ma'am elizabeth cried do not go i beg you will not go mr collins must excuse me he can have nothing to say to me that anybody need not hear i am going away myself but her mother's lizzie 
i insist upon your staying and hearing mr collins compelled her to remain with results for which we must ever be grateful to mrs bennett it is not clear however that mr holder was a suitor for jane we are left in doubt both as to his hopes and his demerits there is a little matter connected with the quarterly's two articles in praise of jane which is perhaps worth noting here gifford who was editor when both appeared was so warm a supporter of the prince regent that hazlitt one of gifford's beasts wrote in an open letter to him when you damn an author one knows that he is not a favourite at carlton house now the prince is said to have been so fond of jane austen's novels that he kept a set in each of his residences and it is unquestionable that in consequence of a suggestion that was equivalent to a command she dedicated emma to him you will be pleased to hear she wrote on april first eighteen sixteen to john murray the first who published the book that i have received the prince's thanks for the handsome copy i sent him of emma whatever he may think of my share of the work yours seems to have been quite right in the same letter she expresses her disappointment at the total omission of mansfield park in the quarterly's review of her work in the preceding autumn as to that review it is a curious fact that until lockhart's life of scott appeared waitley who wrote the eighteen twenty one article was credited with the authorship of the earlier review and it is still to be found against his name in the british museum catalogue not from the ignorance of the cataloguers but because he appears as author on the title page of a reprint of the article issued at Ahmedabad in eighteen eighty nine. End of chapter four.